All right, guys. Welcome. <laughs> Welcome. To Where's My Latte? This is your A Push podcast from your two lovely teachers, Miss Healy and Miss Colazzo. What's up, guys? So today we're going to start Chapter 7. It's the Jeffersonian era. Um, we did change the PowerPoint slide color because it was gray and it was really awful, and now it's blue, which is the soul of America. Mm -hmm. All right? Agreed. Here we go. Um, all right. All right. Let's get in. I don't. I can't use the all mouse because right. I'm do it. in a bad spot, guys. All right. Here we go. Yes. Wow. Just look at the majesty. Need we say more? Um, a little bit, probably. <laughs> so for my art students, um, my art history students from back in the day, just look at those ionic columns. Have you ever seen such a nice volute? I mean, it's beautiful. But the point being that it's um, definitely neoclassical, and we know that there's lots of influence from um, things happening in France. Um, the desire to sort of <clears throat> bond themselves historically with um, ancient Greece and democracy. So there's that. Okay, right. moving on. <clears throat> Education. That's what we do, guys. Very important. That's this thing. Okay, so I know that in my class, in Colossus class, we talked a little bit about um, Republican motherhood and how it increases opportunities for women in education, and then we talked about the bad side. But we have a little bit more to talk about here. Um, and it'll rely on some of your background knowledge for sure. So, uh, Ms. Healy, want to take it away? Yeah. So the first little bullet there, the importance of virtuous citizenry, um, what we were really looking for in public education, which we see already with the Northwest Ordinance and providing for public education, um, the importance of that is that we know we have to educate people in order for them to vote. And we want educated voters, so that's why we are providing for a public education and the government is providing for um, just learned individuals in society. And we've talked about this before. Um, so back in the day, in the colonial period, even up through into the revolution, we're really looking at the north. It's primarily going to be church-related education. Mm -hmm. And in the south, it's really provided by the family. And my class read a little TJ um, document basically telling his daughter – every single minute of her day and what she's supposed to be learning um but only really well-off families were going to get that yeah um, and in the south it's there's going to be more public education in the north the south is really where we see a lot of private education which takes us back to the wealthy families being able to um provide for their children's education yeah and these private else. schools also require tuition <coughs> so we're seeing um i mean it's really just for the the well-off yeah. at that point um, new educational opportunities for women. Uh, we just talked about um, things like Benjamin Rush, like Philadelphia School for the Ladies. It's not called that, but that's Ladies. the basic point of it. So uh, women are going to get, um, you know, they're going to not just be about knitting and, and stitching, although it's not a bad skill to have. I mean, it's art. It's art. It's, I bet I can go on Etsy and make some money if I yeah. wanted to. So still important for everybody, <laughs> not just for the ladies. Um, but we're going to see them focus more on things like arithmetic and language. And Seminaries history. for women. What? Look at this picture. Seminary. Oh, guys, you don't see it, but it's in your textbook, and it's really nice. Yeah. It's two ladies you. learning about learning God. About God. It's nice. Amazing. Okay. Um, the push for education for women it's going to come from that Republican motherhood piece that we talked about in period three, mm -hmm. which is today for my kids. Yeah, CA and class. there's, it's, Republican motherhood, I have such, you know, I've, I'm conflicted. <laughs> I want women to get that education, but. Make that money. Make that money, girl. Get that bag. But then you're going to call them a witch, and that, then we get some more problems, so. <laughs> To be continued on the ladies. <laughs> we'll see. Um, Indian education. So there is a really distinct difference, uh, Miss Nol Miss sorry, Miss Healy and I were just talking it's about, true. that um, there's a pretty big difference between Native American, views of Native Americans and views of African Americans. Um, the term noble savage is used in your book, which is a horrible term. Yeah, don't use that in everyday life, please. Right, or probably not all. Like, like don't even think it. Don't think that. That's awful. Um, but the idea of being a noble savage is that <coughs> Native Americans were savages, um, but that they had sort of in them the ability to improve and to learn and to become better. 
uh, and this was lacking in the African American community. Right. We saw Native Americans as we could educate them and they could improve, quote unquote improve. Um, but we couldn't do that to African Americans because if we educated African Americans, what were they going to do? They were going to revolt. They were going to revolt. Can't do it. And so we couldn't risk that, especially down in the South when we needed them for our economy. I mean, needed. Quote unquote is a, needed. It's a strong Very word, strong. right? <laughs> it's uh, probably better if it was just, you know, free labor. Free labor. That'd be <laughs> we'll more, do that. That'd be more appropriate. Moving Morally. forward. Okay, adjust. fine. All right. <laughs> Okay, so I think um, from this, so higher education is not public oh. during this period. Um, you just got to pay for it. So, again, it's really just going to be the rich guys. Rich people getting, getting that getting that knowledge. Hello, we're back. Okay, sorry about <laughs> that. All right, so rise of cultural nationalism. It's one of our A-push um, themes that we have to like American identity. Mm -hmm. And we're, this is a great unit for starting to see how we separate from people. Um, from England in particular. So medicine and science, Benjamin Rush, who, you know, he was writing all the stuff about ladies' education, doing the Constitution, stuff like that. Um, turns out he also is a murderer. Yeah, big proponent of bleeding. Yeah, he thought it was like the new thing would just start letting people like bleed out and they all died. And by all died, I mean, I assume they all died. That's because they very were bleeding dangerous. out. dangerous. <laughs> That's not Don't insane. do that. <laughs> um, all right, but... I like this slide because I feel like that's like the leeches stuff too. Yeah. Man, yeah, don't do that. Don't do any of that Take a stuff. Pill. Whoa, don't. <laughs> Unless your doctor prescribes it. Unless your doctor prescribes it. Okay. Medical professions <laughs> uh, use scientific method to justify the expanding role to new care. Basically, what we see is there's this thing called midwifery. Midwifery. Midwifery is um, basically like a doctor. Like, a Ph.D. doctor isn't going to deliver your baby. It's somebody um, who is trained in basically everything up to the point of surgery um, for childbirth. Um, today, it's still a very popular option mm -hmm. for ladies. Um, it's predominantly women today. And my guess is probably predominantly women back in the day. Probably. Until uh, some guys decided they wanted to come in and, like, shove their way into, you know, whatever baby delivering process this is and they're like no more midwifery that's not good enough they probably let all those ladies die too probably because we see not just because they wanted to well that but because we see increase in medical schools starting university of pennsylvania the first medical school the rise in gr people graduating from medical school the rise in physicians is going to lead to the decline in midwifery which is males. Right. Taking over. True. Okay. All right. Cultural aspirations in the new nation. Um, Noah Webster is one of Miss Healy's favorites, so I'm going to let her chat about that. <laughs> Go ahead. So what this has to do, we wanted to separate our culture after the revolution, our culture, from um, Britain's culture. So one of the ways we did that, that was by taking all the U's out of words. Um, the reason that we spell honor, O. Oh, H-O-N-O-R, instead of throwing a U in there, or color without a U, is because of no Webster. We were separating ourselves from Britain in the spelling world. Kind of step it up again. Step it up. Yeah. Um, we also know that one of the ways we kind of identify ourselves as American versus British is that we start really working on our own art schools here mm -hmm. and, like, groups of individuals. We're going to talk about them later. Um, for sure during uh, <coughs> Manifest Destiny, but right now it wouldn't hurt to um, just talk, not talk, but mention the beginning of the Hudson River School for those of you that are big Thomas Cole fans. I mean, who's not? <laughs> so, a little oxbow, a little self-portrait in there. Never All right. Yeah, but we're going to teach Miss Healy about it. Because I it's have no idea. so wonderful. <laughs> um, and then what would America be without stories like Rip Van Winkle and the Headless Horseman? We would be nowhere. Right. So part of um, our American kind of folk tale um, development during this early period um, really is part of how do we set ourselves apart. We kind of build our own culture in that way. And it's a social culture, I guess, that is 
redundant because culture social is culture. social, but you get what I mean. <laughs> um, it's not a political culture, it's a social one. Uh, so all of that's important here and how we move towards being like American in our identity. All, all right. right, let's go to the next slide, guys. Next. <coughs> I've already talked about this, haven't you? DSM? Yeah. Yeah, a little bit. Okay, well, that's all you need. I really got <laughs> into it when uh, we started talking about all the uh, founding fathers. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so deism, deism, whatever you'd, you'd like. Um, this is generally described as affected the Enlightenment. Um, a lot of our founding fathers, George, good old mm -hmm. Georgie, TJ. Mm-hmm. Probably all the other ones. Probably a lot of people. Thomas Paine. Thomas Paine. T-Paine. Neil Armstrong. Neil Armstrong. That's... I brought that to the table this morning. I didn't know that, guys. I needed to discuss it. That's... Put it in your notes, okay? <laughs> so, deism um, is just the belief that there is a God. He sets the world in motion. He's the kind of quote-unquote clockmaker. Uh, and then he, like, backs up. Dips. Starts to play his video games or something in the background because he's not going to help Lord. us out every single day. Um, so, that just basically means that our everyday life is guided by um, natural law. Reason. Reason. And natural. Yes. Yes. Okay. <clears throat> the second great awakening. The first one was so nice, they brought it back, guys. They so brought nice. it. They did it twice. So nice, we did it twice. All right. <laughs> so, um, there's. it just says African Americans and the revivals and Indians in the second great awakening, but let's talk about the second great awakening. Let's really get into it. Because there's something called um, a burned over district. <laughs> burned over district. This is happening in Rochester, New York. Anyone know where that is? And do you know where that is, guys? <laughs> it's just in New York somewhere. Burned over district. And uh, unlike the name, they don't actually burn anything, but they do burn for Jesus. For Jesus, <laughs> and they burn with religious excitement. And so that's why they call it the burned over district because it literally is just like burning through the towns, and everybody's like all excited. Yes, lots um, of revivals, mm -hmm. lots of camp meetings, camps, I camp. I don't know where do you camp. camp? Where do you camp, guys? You camp out in the frontier. So that's where these things are. The frontier. Rochester. <laughs> the Wild West. <laughs> Wild West, guys. <laughs> um, but we start to see uh, the frontier after we see Rochester and we see all these people. Like, I mean, well, maybe we should talk about that. What exactly is this revival and how is it different from the First Great Awakening? Mm. First of all, no DJ George Whitefield. And uh, that is a loss. So skip over the Second Great Awakening. Just not important. <laughs> what a loss. Um, so things that are going to be important in this, um, second great awakening, uh, we really reject at this point, things like predestination, just mm -hmm. gone. People really are looking for, um, an identity and this particularly is going to be about women finding that identity, women becoming, um, a really prominent part of the second great awakening. Lots more but women in involved in the church. So many more. Right? Because mm -hmm. they're hanging out at home. They're doing their stuff because they're trying to be like Republican mothers and all that. And they got to find their soul. They got to right. find who they are inside. So they start going to these things. Uh, but that's not all, ladies and gentlemen. Oh. We also start to see the rise of black preachers during this period. Now, I know what you're thinking. But wait a second. We aren't supposed to, like, teach people, like, teach slaves anything. Because then they're going to rebel. <clears throat> but here's the twist. Preachers... Black preachers go into these communities and they start working with people and start teaching biblical text, not as many people in the South do, which is to give validation to slavery, mm -hmm. but rather to show them an opportunity to find freedom within their own condition. So it becomes like a hopeful situation, uh, but not one that necessarily will instigate rebellion. It's just nice. It's just nice. It's like, we're going to get through this, guys. Intrinsic yeah. value. Yes. Um. Mm. You know what else happens during the Second Great Awakening? It is the Mormons. The Mormons! The new churches that, well, there's Baptists, mm -hmm. there's Presbyterians. Methodist. Methodist. But then there's the, the Mormons. Mormons. And that starts in New York as well. <sighs> new York. Very and, popular place. And then, guys, the Mormons, because people are like, we don't know about what's happening with you guys. And we're not going to... I don't, we don't need the story of what the Mormons, how they came about. No. Okay, so the Mormons basically <laughs> get on out of New York because people are chasing them away. Right. And then they run out into, like, Indiana or something. And, like, John Smith, not John Smith, Joe Smith, Joseph. Joe Smith. Joseph Smith. 
Joseph Smith gets killed yeah. in a prison. They, like, hack him up. Mm-hmm. And then all his people are like, let's get out and bring him young. Kind of pulls everybody out into so Utah. Utah. Utah's where they stay. That's where they go, guys. That's how they get there. It's part of the Second Great Awakening. Mm-hmm. This is amazing. Okay. And they've been there ever since. Ever since. We're going to talk more about them. Just hold your horses. Just sit tight. Sit tight. Because they're fun. Don't move. All right. You want to talk about Native Americans real quick? Um, yeah, there was just a the dislocation, I guess, of the Native Americans. Oh, yeah. Americans. So we keep moving them around, guys. We keep moving the Native Americans all over the place, and they're like, we're just tired, okay? You've taken us from our people. You've shoved us out of our homeland. Uh, and this sense of community, while it is like a European-style, um, like, Christian community, it provides a sense of stability within that Native American community. So they actually do... We see a lot of effect of the Second Great Awakening on Native Americans. All right. All right. Guess what's next, guys? The good stuff. I feel like I keep saying that. Guess what's Guess next? Guess what's coming. It's just the next slide. There it is. <laughs> guys, America is built on industry. But do you know that it... All right. Okay. Transportation. This guy, very handsome. Mm. <laughs> Maybe not. Okay, no. <laughs> He actually is very scary. Um, he created the steamboat. Um, do you want to tell them what the name is? Of the steamboat? This steamboat is called the Claremont. The Claremont. It's multiple syllables. It's you not just two. You can't just say Claremont. It's not the Claremont. It's the Claremont. The Claremont. Yeah, that's yes. it. Um, what this did was it allowed our ships to travel upstream and downstream, which is going to do wonders for our trade. Yeah, guys, and also, just side note, don't forget that we're using the heck out of that Mississippi River because of Pinckney's Treaty. Oh, we're crushing the Mississippi. We're crushing the Mississippi River. We got it. (laughs) All right? So we're using rivers, but that's not it. No, no. We also have something called a turnpike. It's a it's a toll road basically. Yeah. We used to have them. You know, JTB used to be a toll road back in the day. It's going to be a toll road again. No, two ninety five is. Yeah. yeah, whatever. Um, so basically, anyway, if you want to use it, you got to pay. And that's how it pay the road pays for itself. Mm-hmm. Um, but those are before like eighteen thirty um, turnpikes, steamboats. Those are really our biggest forms of transportation. Mm-hmm. But it also brings to light that we need changes to our edu- or to our education to our transportation right. system we need more which i feel like we do later we'll eventually get there we'll get there we don't need it right now rising cities guess what nobody lives in the cities i mean yeah it's like three percent of the population and it's like all rich people because mm-hmm. that's where the culture is yeah you don't see me right now but i'm i'm putting my hand up and making a gesture that suggests culture <laughs> i'll show you in class it's very it she looks very wealthy Thank you. <laughs> okay, guys. Look at him. This is it. We're in it. This is where it comes to. <laughs> First things I think about with Jefferson, strict constructionist. Wanted to constantly revise the Constitution. Did you all know that? He wanted, like, every 20 years to come back to the Constitution and be like, let's fix it for our new culture. Because he couldn't have implied powers. Yeah, I can't do it. you got to keep changing it. It has to be it. in the Constitution, so we want to continuously amend it. Constantly, but we don't do that. Sorry, TJ. You're out on this one. That's a lot of steps to take. So, what are we going to talk about here? The federal city dun, 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 dun. and the people's president. Oh, wait. Nice. No, we're good. Forget yeah, it. That's fine. Okay. Um, French architect Pierre L'Enfant. L'Enfant. Uh, so, basically, the new capital city, which is Washington, D.C., is basically a neoclassical city because we want to. Make our capital reminiscent of the Greeks and how democratic <laughs> they were. But also, yes. the Greeks weren't that great. I mean... Don't get me started. <laughs> Next. Jefferson the politician. <laughs> okay. I was like, do you want me to switch the slide? <laughs> All right. Jefferson the politician. Jeffersonian democracy. Was he Jeffersonian? Yeah, yeah, I guess. I mean, he is Jefferson. He is Jefferson. Um, strict constitutionalist, mm-hmm. as we discussed. Um, 
Listen, he's agrarian. He loves that idea of the I was, farmer. I was going to say, loves him a good small-time farmer. Loves it. Loves a good farmer. I might even call him a yeoman farmer. Oh. What? Oh. <laughs> it's Y-E-O-M-A-N. A yeoman <laughs> farmer is a farmer who, they might own a couple little, like, they might own a couple of slaves, but it's a really little farm. It's basically to survive. Mm-hmm. Um, so. Subsist- that's what, yeah, subsistence farming, we call it. So TJ was, like, all about that. Again, he didn't hate industry. He was like, but we got to keep it real, and America is about the farmers. Um, and he liked to project that image himself. So if you're mm-hmm. like me, and probably Miss Seeley, and you think to yourself, man, I just, when I think of America, I think of a farmer, then that's because of TJ. Mm-hmm. I definitely think that every single day. Yeah, it's why I continue to garden. Because I, I garden. feel like I become a person of the earth. Mm-hmm. It doesn't make sense, but it does. Okay. <laughs> so, Jefferson the politician, got it. Also, got small it. gov. Did we say that? Oh, he does like small gov. Small government. government, small military. I think that's on that one. Yeah, he's going to reduce the size of the mil. Ooh, yep. It's coming oh, up next. It's coming. Mm. All right. Is that it? Hold on. <laughs> oh. Yeah, that's fine. <laughs> yeah, that's good. All right. Speaking of small military and small government, let's do it. Um, as Democratic Republicans do, wanted to, uh, I feel like I'm out of order. Yeah, I think so. Um, nope. All right. Here we are. Here we go. Um, wanted to reduce the size of the federal government, wanted to also reduce the size of the military. He didn't want to live in a military state. Yeah, well, nobody does. Who wants to live in a military we state? We talked about That's this scary. with, like, the colonies. Like, yeah. we are not okay with a big military because... No. We're always afraid that we're doing something wrong. Think about it. Driving down the road, a police officer's behind you, minding his business, doing his job, protecting us. But you're still afraid of him. But you're scared. Because mm-hmm. you may or may not be doing something wrong. You just don't know. Do so. I have a tail light out? Is my tag renewed? Mm-hmm. I don't know. You don't know. What's the speed limit? Okay. But anyway, this small military, though, we're going to run into a challenge with um, some pirates. The Barbary Pirates. They were pirating. (laughs) (laughs) Um, So they're off the Barbary Coast. Which is in? Tripoli. Which is in? The Mediterranean. (laughs) So uh, basically the Barbary Pirates, they're pirates, guys. They're just taking everything. Right. They're just out there like taking stuff. As pirates do. As they do. They're just being their own pirate selves. They're just living their pirate lives. Okay. um, And basically we are going to... um, have, they demand they've taken some of our stuff um i believe at this point it's even uh in re- there's some issues with the slave trade that's happening with britain and then with america uh and jefferson is requested not politely to pay a ransom to the pirates um and then we do honestly this isn't really that big of a deal no. for us we just don't have a military big enough to go out there and force the pirates to do as we say um so basically we need a bigger military not to protect like not to restrict civil liberties but to fight the pirates hadn't we been dealing with these pirates for For so long so long and we were just like whatever pirates fine yeah just our oh my gosh she saw a picture of john she saw a picture of john marshall guys i well i clearly am Okay. Really no, I'm just going to sit back. I'm going to let you do this. Okay. Part. So, John Marshall, very important in expanding the size of the federal government, which you may ask yourself, how, during Jefferson, How's that are happen? we expanding the size of the federal government? I remember. Oh. Guys, the judicial branch is the only thing that stays federalist. Yep. Judicial branch. Very important. Um, Congress flips to Democratic Republican. Mm-hmm. The Revolution of 1800. That's Jefferson, that's Congress, they're all Democratic Republican, except for John Marshall. He's our Federalist Supreme Court Justice. And Federalists like big government. Big, big gov. So, what happened with Marbury versus Madison? And how are we talking about judicial review? So, at the tail end of John Adams's time in office, he's going to appoint bunches of justices of the peace, of different federal um, court system justices, 
And uh, we're going to call those midnight appointments, which sounds super sketchy. I love like, it. I love writing midnight appointments up on the board. Also, the technical term uh, was an act passed called the Judiciary Act of 1801. That was in last chapter. So, mm-hmm. um, Yes, that's what all the appointments were. Um, so, Marbury, being one of those justices, he went and, um, well, James Madison, who's Secretary of State, refused to put him in his in his office. They and, actually repealed the mm-hmm. Judiciary Act of 1801 and cancel any empty spots that Adams was trying to fill last minute. Yes. That is smart but slimy. Aggressive. That's weird. So Marbury, William Marbury, he's like, yo, put me in my spot. That's not fair. Goes up to the Supreme Court and Marshall's like, okay, you do deserve to be in your spot. Sure. But Congress didn't have the right to pass the Judiciary Act of 1789 before 1801 that said that Congress had to um, enforce any acts. Enforcement only belongs to the executive branch, and therefore the Judiciary Act of 1789 is null and void, and that was our first instance of judicial review. Guys, that's so big. That's huge. First of all, John Marshall had to get in his like little go-kart and travel around because there's no Supreme Court like place. Right. So he's going around in his little go cart. He's in his golf cart. He's in his golf cart, <laughs> going around Nocatee, and he's like, "Go, we're going back and repealing like one of the very first acts done in the creation of the Supreme Court. This is crazy. And it's just one part of it that he's going to say, that's not okay, but it's massive. And then it establishes this idea of judicial review, which is the whole point of the court system. And that makes the federal government so powerful that they can say nope, 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 nope to any law that's passed. Um, what do we call that, guys? Checks and balances. Checks Look it up. and balances. That's amazing. I could go on and on and on about judicial review. And John Marshall. But I won't. <laughs> I was just going to let her, guys. It's fine. <laughs> Come hang out in my government class and we'll talk about him. <laughs> All right, so we're going to keep talking about judicial review. We have a lot of court cases coming mm-hmm. up, though not in this unit, or not in this chapter. chapter. Um, and so we will come back to that. Next slide. We Bloop. also we also impeach a Supreme Court justice. Samuel Chase. Samuel Chase. And we realize impeachment is um, it's a lot of steps, and we're not going to do that often. So now yeah. we only impeach. All right, so... This slide we're going to discuss more in class. Well, this information on this slide we're going to discuss more in class, right? But we're going to very quickly just Skim introduce the surface, the complexity that is Jefferson. Yes. So from world history, you all remember Toussaint Louverture. Um, he is a Haitian slave who rebels. Rises up against the man. Rises up and defeats all that is bad in the world. Um, So (laughs) Haiti's going to be free. Yay. Yay. Go Haiti. Go Haiti. Um, Toussaint goes back to France and he dies. It's so sad. But is a travesty. He did good things. He died of like we remember him fondly or something. Yeah. No. no, Nothing because of this. I feel like. Yeah. It wasn't torture. I mean, he did die like in prison, but it wasn't. Through any punishment. When okay. he was sick. Being anyway. in prison is punishment, but. That's a thing. Okay. Okay. So, besides that. So. <laughs> so, Napoleon. Anyway. Sorry, we were we just. We just got our picture was, taken. Someone was taking our pictures. Anyway. So, Toussaint Louverture's leading a revolution up in Haiti, and Napoleon gets into a bit of a financial pickle. Well, what Napoleon wants to do is take Haiti and uh, his territory in North America that he still had from back in the day, uh, and he wants to make a like a sugar empire. But when Haiti, I, I mean, talk about money, yeah, right. right? Um, but when Haiti is in the rebellion and he loses it, at that point his empire is over. There's mm-hmm. no way for him to get around that. Plus, you know, money. Let's get some money. So he well, makes an offer. That's where a lot of sugar is too. It's down in the Caribbean. So. For sure, it is. You lose one. Yeah. You lose them all. Um, cotton doesn't grow very well down there. No. Um, other rice. Stuff. Rice. Meh. Meh. Tobacco. It's not bad. Tobacco. Not, not good. happening. Mm-hmm. Yeah. But sugar. That's where it is. All right. So Napoleon makes an offer. It's an offer you can't refuse. That's a really bad Godfather impression. <laughs> but that uh, what it is is the Louisiana Purchase. Jefferson's quandary is what is going to be next. Take it away. Okay, so this was the 
internal struggle of Jefferson since day one. Since day one, because Jefferson, if you will recall from previous unit, he is a strict constitutionalist. Strict. He doesn't strict. like implied power. Doesn't like implied power. Well, where in the Constitution does it say that we can buy Louisiana, that we can double the size can't of do it. the nation? He can't do it. Mm -mm. And so that was his internal struggle. Is this going to be good for America? Potentially, yeah. yes, in the long run, especially for Jefferson's ideal agrarian society. This is for the farmers, y'all. All right? For the, for the farmers. For the little guy. It's farmers need land. And mm -hmm. Louisiana Purchase, that's, that's a lot. Stop it. So the issue was the constitutional, well, for Jefferson, was the constitutional issue. That's his quandary. Um, of course, we know we have that land now, so we know how that worked out. Mm -hmm. That's what we're going to cover in class. Yeah, we'll talk more about that in um, class. Because this is a constitutional issue. We'll, we'll continue to cover it. Yeah. So, so let's uh, go forward just a bit. Here's a map. There's a map, guys. Noise. What is it even? Well, there, mm. there's the uh, there's Louisiana Purchase. There it is. There it is, guys. <laughs> there it is. <laughs> oh, what did we go over there to buy Initially, we went over there because we wanted New Orleans that the French had yeah. back from. We Spain. always want that port. We have, it's all about the money. That's what we want and the the right to that river. And then we went over there, and Napoleon was like, "Oh, here's this whole thing." And we're like, "By the way, uh, take it all." Yeah, sure, why not? Take it all. So thanks, James Madison. Thanks, Do you not want John Solid. Very good. So not um, John Day. <laughs> the next thing on this that I see as significant is this Lewis and Clark. Um, I think we'll talk about that a little bit later. It's eh. all right. Yeah, it's fine. Talking about second Julia. Yeah. Yes. Birthing Queen. a baby and still and continuing on. Give me a break. Um, Lewis and Clark. We'll do that later. But Burr conspiracy. My class has talked about this a little bit. Um, I'm not. I, I'm good with it. Are you good yeah. with it? He's just a, a cuckoo bird. He's a cuckoo. He's a. He wanted to have the kingdom. Burristan. Burristan. I don't think that's accurate. That's not what it was. <laughs> that's what we call that's it. That's what, what it is in my head. Um, but he wanted to um, take the Southwest and control it, like be the king of Mexico. Mm -hmm. He's crazy. And then he shoots, he shoots. Well, he Hamilton. still got massive beef from Hamilton yeah. throwing support for Jefferson over Burr, who was about to win the presidency. Stop it. Watch Hamilton. Watch it. Go to the I York, have not. Buy a ticket. But I hear it's wonderful. I'll let you borrow the CD because I have it. Excellent. Okay. Next. Guys, this is where it gets good. We're almost Ooh. done with this unit. It's crazy. Oh, wow. We just started. Um, so, <laughs> conflict on the seas. America's predicament seems super generic, but here we go. Napoleon is out there just taking over everything in Europe. Mm -hmm. uh, and he's got beef with Britain. He's got beef with every, everybody. And guess what America does? Same thing we did before. Neutrality. We don't right. have anything to We're do with it. We're staying out of it. Washington told us to. We're out. We're done. But... But then we have impressments still. Yeah. We've talked about impressments since the Mutiny Act, which wasn't important that we knew the act, but Britain was doing was this to colonists um, back in the day because they're like, well, you guys need to fight our wars for us. And we're like, but it's against ourselves. So impressments are no bueno. <laughs> it's basically kidnapping. And mm -hmm. by basically, I mean it, it is, is kidnapping. kidnapping. Yeah. Um, and so they started up again. Thought we were friends. We did this in the quasi war. What are we doing? Although right. that was friends. Now, we do impressments, or they do impressments here. And then, get this, they re-impress our people because then they go on American merchant ships and they're like, oh, look, you guys are castaways and, and you ran away from our Navy. Get back and get do back it again. In <laughs> Thought I told you once. They're crazy. So, so we do have a little bit of debate over the pronunciation of this next event. Um, I prefer to say, because I assume this is how a British person would say it, um, the Chesapeake and Leopard Affair. And me, Being just a regular old pedestrian American, I say it's Leopard. So fine. We'll say Chesapeake and Leopard incident. <laughs> um, basically, the Brits roll up in their boat. Mm -hmm. The Leopard. The Leopard. And, the Chesapeake is our boat. And they see the Chesapeake and they're like, get on our boat. We're going to impress all you guys. And um, America's like, I don't think so. And what do we do? Bam, bam, bam. Okay? Yeah. So we start a fight. We're like, get off of our boat. Things are getting really nasty, though. And we'll talk a little bit more about that because all of this information uh, is the stuff that Dealey and I, Miss Knowles, we like to talk about. All right? I love it. So here we go. Peaceful coercion. It's like so stupid. Right. 
Guys, I can't. We're trying to, like, trick everybody into thinking that we're neutral, but, like, we're not neutral. Right. So the whole point of being neutral, like we've talked about Just before, is to stay out of it and make all the money. While everybody's fighting, we make all the money. Mm-hmm. And so at this point, um, Jefferson's like, I know what we're going to do. We're going to coerce people into listening to right. not impressing our, our people mm-hmm. and not stealing our stuff. Um so we are going to place an embargo on people. We're, we're gonna, economically we're going to hit people where it hurts. People hit people where it hurts, which is the pockets, the money bags, the money bags. So <laughs> what happens with the embargo act? Nothing good. It's all awful, guys. Um, <clears throat> I'm going to give you some information in class, but it like tanks our economy. It's the worst. It hurts American shippers. Yes. It hurts merchants. Mm-hmm. It hurts American industry. It It's a slow trickle down to everybody. It's, it's going to hurt everybody. It's not good. Also, by the way, TJ, I thought that you were a strict uh, constructionist who says the president says can just can do it? stop the economy. Right. Nobody. No. Nope. Two problems. Now Jefferson has two problems. Jefferson. Is he Jeffersonian? Discuss. Discuss. Um, so we pass a few acts that, like, allow us to go less and less of, like, ease up on that embargo. And we're also kind of taking more sides, like the Non-Intercourse Act, which we'll get we'll talk about in class. Mm-hmm. Followed um, closely by making makes bill number, number two, two, not number one, that yep. died in Congress. Yeah. Um, so we'll talk about that in class more. We'll get to all the good economic stuff, which I love talking about economics. So I mean, I do it. She to- tolerates it. I like the social I go stuff. in depth. All right. So the Indian problem and the British. Here's what you need to know about the Speaking Indian problem. Of I'm not. I'm not honestly going to be too concerned with like the battles that are happening at this moment. Um, other than saying that we are quite suspicious of the British instigating conflict in America because mm-hmm. they still have beef with us. Um, they're supposed to get up and get out. We know that they haven't done that over and over again. That was a long time ago. Right. It was. Uh, that was J- no, J- pick- Picking, no, Jay. Jay Jay's Treaty. Treaty. Yeah. Jay's Treaty, they're supposed to all get out of the waterways and the forts, and they didn't do it. They didn't do it, and now they're they're riling everybody up on yeah. the frontier. They're like, oh, no, it'd be great, Native Americans, if everybody got together Here's and established guns. a confederacy, and we're freaking out in the meantime. So this Indian problem, which I, I hesitate that it's... It's a little it's, racist. It's quoted like that. Um, <laughs> it's the British... Pro- or it's the American problem with, with the Indians. Yes. Um, and uh, it's basically that... We feel like the British are instigating conflict, mm-hmm. and Mama no likey. So. Yeah, our problem is really with the with the British. It is William Henry Harrison. We call him Tippecanoe. Yeah, good stuff. We'll come back to you. We'll come back to you. So this Tecumseh and the Prophet. Prophet is his brother, um, and this is again just the building up of a confederacy. Um, and while the Americans are able to suppress this Native American conflict through the Battle of Tippecanoe, America wins. Um, it's a moment where we become very fearful of the ability of Native Americans to uh, group together. Mm-hmm. This is a flash forward to the ghost dance. Yeah. Um, but it also, it's happening in the South, and we're frustrated. It's happening in the North, and we're frustrated. And we know who's doing it. At the end of the day, it's the British. British. So we want to go get Canada, and we want to go get Florida. Yep. Expansion. We're going to expand. We're going to do it. Now, there is a group of people who, in particular, are really advocates of this expansion, and we call them the Warhawks. They are from the central states, like Kentucky, Tennessee, and then the south, right? The south? Yeah. yeah. The south. And I feel like, uh, oh, I feel like they have Clay. a chain. Don't the... Um, <laughs> wow, yeah. <laughs> don't the, uh, the Seattle Seahawks, don't they come out and flap their wings at a football game? Yes, they do. do they? <laughs> they do. And I feel like that's the Warhawks when they go into Congress. They just, like, flap their wings. Like, Flapping you know it's up. coming. War. They're so, very, very into war. They're like, we need to fight. What, I don't care what we're <clears throat> fighting about, but let's fight. That's sort of their attitude. Right. Um, and so what are they saying they're fighting for? They're like, oh, we're fighting for uh, because of impressments. No, you're not. No, you're not. You don't care about impressments. You care about expansion. Yeah, more land. Own it. Making America look strong, powerful. Yeah, nationalism. And more... More land equals more power. Yeah. Um, <coughs> we're just going to skip that. Yeah. That is oh, just unnecessary. Look who it is. It's Mr. Pickard's fa- Here it is. Look at that. Look at that map. Look at it. Mm-hmm. Oh, 
Um, hello, Knowles, do you see this? Look at all the fighting up in the north and <laughs> all <laughs> the fighting down in the south. My mouse didn't go that far. Look at all of that, okay? <laughs> because we know that a lot of this is about territorial expansion. I up asked and down, you but this. Not in the middle. If it was really about the merchants and how bad we felt for them, where are the battles? Where are the Navy battles? Yeah, where are the battles off of uh, Boston? Mm. American they ain't history there. books have lied to you. Yes. All right. All right. Oh. <laughs> I make that noise because this is so good. It's so good. All those um, merchants with the Hartford Convention, they're all like, oh my gosh, you we're guys so have to sad. fight for us because we're so sad. Oh, we're so poor now. And poor when merchants. nobody did anything because the war was really about territory, right. they're like, well, guess what? We out. Yeah. Stop it. That's crazy. We out meaning like the federalists out of the country. We're leaving. There are things you need to fix with your constitution. We're really tired of having a whole bunch of southern people be president. We don't like anything. We didn't want to go to war and look what's happening. And then at that moment, it just so happened that the war wasn't going well. And so people were like, oh, maybe you have a point, federalists. But guess what? They don't have a point. And then the federalists go away. Yeah, the federalists are on their way. Boom. Because that's not... That's not patriotic at all to leave it's America. Not. not a chance. All right, anyway. And then the War of 1812 is over. Done. Done. And everything goes back to the way it was before. Yeah, so you should know the Treaty of Ghent. Good stuff like that. Um, yeah. We'll talk about that, obviously, in class. Um, basically, <laughs> it says, back up England, because we're number one. We're number one. I thought Knowles was going to join in with me, but uh, she did no. not. So uh, we are going <laughs> to... Dang it, the memo. <laughs> we are going to play out to that. I would play you our music, but it is not cued to go so with this ladies and gentlemen (laughs) this is your first episode of where's my latte more to come see you next time study study